Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to start with Asterix the Gaul. In this series about the indomitable Gauls, there is an early adventure called Asterix and the Goths. There is a scene where two Roman legionaries stumble across two of their comrades, bound and gagged. And the legionaries mistake these um, uh, restrained legionaries as, um, it's a long story, um, goth prisoners who are actually Asterix and Obelix who they're searching for. And one legionary turns to the other and says, look, a fat one and a little one, Visigoths. And his comrade turns and says, Visigoths? Why the past tense? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you must take my word for it that this is very funny. <laughs> I have seen a Times columnist, I work at the Times, I have seen a Times columnist crease up in laughter on reading this. But getting the wordplay, getting the gag, depends on knowing Latin grammar. And not everyone knows Latin grammar. It took me until well into my 30s to realize that there was a joke here. The joke was made up, like everything else in the English editions of Asterix, by the translator Anthea Bell. Uh, she is my mother, and I grew up with these characters. I was the sort of prototype of children of, say, eight or nine or ten who read Asterix and enjoy it, who know that there must be secret grown-up jokes here somewhere, but we don't worry about them. It took me into my th until well into my 30s to get this joke about Latin grammar. I, I just didn't like to ask her in case she concluded that she had brought into the world a son possessing the cranial capacity of Obelix the Gaul. So I just let it go. She is the only translator in any language to have done uh, almost all the Asterix editions. She translated, I think, 37 or 38, up until the last uh, one that appeared at the end of last year. The, um, the secret, the little secret, the unspoken secret about Asterix is that they are variable in quality. The first run with the author Gossini, René Gossini, uh, who died tragically prematurely in 1977, is a comic masterpiece of wordplay and topical illusions. The second run under the um, illustrator who took on the authorship, Albert Udezo, is a bit more like children's books. The early ones and the most recent under a new team are classics of comic fiction. Publishers in the UK in initially were very wary of running Asterix. The series initially um, came out in France in the late 1950s. It took 10 years for them to be published in English. Two publishers I know turned them down because the wordplay was untranslatable, which of course, strictly speaking, it is. You've got to make up new jokes, new puns, new topical illusions, new cultural illusions specific to Britain. I remember my mother picked me up from school one day and said, uh, hello dear, what do you think of we all live in a yellow quinquireme? I mean, <laughs> think about it. Um, and her philosophy of translation has always been that a work in translation must read as if it is not a work in translation. There is a school of translation that regards freighting a book, freighting a translated work with footnotes is a testament to authenticity. Uh, my mother's philosophy is the opposite. It must read as if it were written in this language. And she created, in its own way, a classic of British com comic fiction. I think of Asterix and Obelix as like Jeeves and Worcester. Uh, one, as Jeeves said of the young master, mentally negligible and one very cunning. Um, it's very different, of course. It's visually uh, very funny. And it has to be translated in such a way that it appeals equally to young children and to scholars of classical civilization. And the jokes have to fit the speech bubbles. She had to count the number of characters to make sure they fit. 
that's a testament to British, specifically British common fiction, uh, comic fiction drawn from a European inspiration. Um, her main language is German, and she has translated many uh, greats of German literature and German nonfiction. She's translated the Brothers Grimm, uh, Kafka, um, Freud, the psychopathology of everyday life. Um, uh, inevitably, uh, being an expert in German, much of her output deals with the barbarous history of the Third Reich and the tragic fate of European Jewry in the 20th century. She translated the memoirs of Traul Junge, uh, who was Hitler's secretary, the ingenue, who was in the bunker with him, who claimed never to have known what was going on. Uh, the memoir was published posthumously at the beginning of this century. It formed the basis of the film Downfall. Um, my mother has also translated the great novel by W.G. Sebald, Austerlitz, the multiple prize winner, about the experience, dramatizing the experience of uh, children on the kinder transport in the 1930s fleeing Nazism. Most especially, uh, she's most especially proud of having changed slightly the perception of Kafka in English. Kafka was translated very early in English by an Orcadian couple, Edwin and Willa Muir, um, who drained the novels of the essential humor. They were very reverential. These are the long-standing Penguin Classics editions of Kafka. Um, and the, the, um, the term Kafka-esque in English has come to be seen as something forbidding. It's actually, in German, it's more like uh, what we would think of as Python-esque. It's very funny. Um, a new series of translations, including my mother's of the castle, um, has put the humor back. And most specifically, the reputation of the Austrian author Stefan Zweig has been resurrected in recent years in English. He was, in an earlier part, he was in the 20th century, for part of the 20th century, the most popular novelist in Europe uh, in the 1920s. He was an exemplar of the Central European Jewish polymaths uh, who um, experimented with modernism and modernist techniques in the 1920s and the 1930s, who, uh, who the Nazis in not just barbarous uh, persecution but Philistine persecution scattered and destroyed. Um, uh, Zweig uh, fled first to this country, in fact. He lived in Bath with his wife, Lotta, for a time. They then fled to exile in Brazil uh, in the town of Petropolis where they uh, took poison in 1942, committed suicide, um, and um, he left a poignant, uh, Zweig left a poignant suicide note that's now in the archives in Jerusalem um, in which he lamented the destruction of the German speaking culture. Um, the Nazis raised his own precious uh, library of books and manuscripts in Salzburg, destroyed it, and um, Zweig uh, gave up the will to live, looking at the destruction of European culture. Um, if you haven't read his work, he was a master of novella. Um, he, uh, highbrow critics slightly look down on him, but he's a master of novella. I would recommend Chess, which is a a depiction of descent into insanity, and his only full-length novel, Beware of Pity, which is a masterful depiction of the involuntary emotional exploitation of a, disabled, a young disabled woman by a cavalry officer. I am, there are different types of linguists, two particular categories of linguist. The everyday sense of linguist is one who translates and understands foreign languages. The a uh, more academic, the more scholarly, more technical term, uh, uh, more technical variant of linguist is one who studies the structure of language. I write a weekly column for the Times that is essentially popular linguistics. And um, I have watched my mother's work and assimilated my own sort of philosophy of linguistics. One is that language is a universal human faculty that we know. It doesn't depend on your education, your social class, your income, or anything at all. It's a universal human faculty. Um, and from this um, distinctive human faculty, some theorists, notably the linguist Noam Chomsky and the cognitive uh, scientist Steven Pinker, have concluded that language is an innate 
uh, human faculty. Um, it's not a view accepted by every scholar uh, of language, but it's one that, to me, as a layperson, seems intuitively plausible because it makes sense of the fact that a non-native adult learner of a foreign language uh, who becomes expert, uh, like my mother, will go to great lengths in order to become fluent, whereas a child, a toddler, will become a master of complex grammatical constructions in their native tongue or tongues without conscious effort and without explicit instruction. Um, and the Chomsky-Pinker idea seems to make sense in the personality of my mother. Um, the second fact about language is that um, my mother has put it to me that uh, somewhere between the original language and the translated word, there's an idea that is not expressed by language. There is a very pervasive common, common idea that language determines the way we see the world. It determines particularly the way we understand social relations. Um, it's exemplified, this idea, in George Orwell's brilliant creation of Newspeak. But it's all wrong. It's all untrue. Um, as Pinker puts it, um, we think not in the words of our language, but in a set of symbols that he calls a universal mentalese. And to me, the work of the translator is the sharp end of this. My mother um, had a massive stroke at the end of 2016. She was hoping to translate the next Asterix book, the one that came out at the end of last year. She went into a nursing home. She uh, is unable to speak, unable to move. Her great mind has now departed. I visit her every week. She does not know who I am. Uh, she has the times delivered to her bedside, but no recollection of why she requested it or what it's for. I'm not downcast by this. I look at her um, literary output, the corpus of her work. And I note that in a world of perplexing ethno-nationalisms, the recrudescence of xenophobia, and particularly its most virulent and ancient form, anti-Semitism, someone who can penetrate the veil of language and bring to life this universal human faculty and this common literary inheritance is something very precious, something very important and increasingly important. And it falls to me, not through any great expertise and certainly a lot less diplomacy than she has, uh, by default to proclaim the importance of that body of work and the art of literary translation, and so I do.